football from the start, but do you remember the last time we met? F no. 15 years ago at the White Elephant. And you, I told you a story, and you said if you ever come on the show, you must tell it. Shall I do it? Please, go okay, well, what was it? Well, I just uh, been to my grandmother's funeral down in Bournemouth. That's a good start for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, and I said, I've, well, very nice to meet you, and I've just uh, buried my grandmother. And you said, oh, yes. And I said, it had a very strange beginning and a very strange end. We'd gone to my mother's. She'd just uh, moved into an old post office. And uh, we were all downstairs pretending to be very solemn and sad. And the match, she had a lodger upstairs who came in for some unknown reason in his shirt sleeves and shorts and Jimmy Young on the radio and said, well, you've got a nice day for it, <laughs> and walked out. Mm. And then we got in the cars and we followed my grandmother's hearse and the registration number of the hearse was RU12. <laughs> And a little further on, we, we arrived at a crossroads, Charminster, and we, our car stopped, and the hearse went ahead, and we were held up by the traffic, and the car by the side of me, I looked out the window, was Bob Hope, and I'd just done a picture with Bob. I put the window down and said, hello, Bob. He said, hi, Lionel, what are you doing? I said, I'm burying my grandmother. He said, that's not funny, Lionel, and drove on. <laughs> so we were late for the funeral, or rather, we were late for the crematorium, and there was no sign of it, but the smoke was all pouring out the chimney. And my brother said to me, trust Grandma, she started without us. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've been, you've been in the business that's a long, long time. In fact, I was astonished to learn, in fact, you've done more than 150 movies. Pretty terrifying. Awful mm -hmm. lot, isn't it? Which, mm. is the, which is the worst one you've made? There's no doubt in my mind. Really? Well, there were, pretty, there were some pretty bad ones, but the worst of all was the picture called The Long Ships. Oh, yes. With Richard Widmark, Sidney Poitier, and a gang of character actors, British character actors, and an Italian actress called Rosano Schiaffino. Uh, you could tell it was a bad picture before it started, even when you read the script, because before the roller caption started at the beginning of the picture, Richard Widmark was seen diving off a cliff into a fjord, and when the roller captions finished, he came out opposite Tangier. And there's a long swim. Yes, a long swim mm. with seaweed sticking out of his ear. And then on the picture itself, there was an extraordinary bit of casting. Uh, Sidney Poitier, who's, I believe, Trinidadian, had to play an Arab. So they had to straighten his nose out every morning and whiten him down. Richard Mudmark used to sit in the middle of us, and they were making this New York cowboy into a Viking. And I sat on the left-hand side, and they were blacking me up as Sidney Poitier's eunuch. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I was doing a full hello there. And, and Richard would used to sit in the middle and could not control himself. That there's Poitier whitening down, and there's me blacking up. <laughs> he, he, he couldn't make up with us anymore. He had to make up on his own. In all this, in all this career that you've had, you've been called many flattering things. You've been called the actor that other actors dread. Oh dear. And somebody else once said, "Have you never worked with dogs, babies, or Lionel Jeffries mm. because you're a scene stealer?" How do you react to that? I, 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 I remember reading it the first time, and I was absolutely horrified. I hated it because I always believed that I'd got on very well with my the fellow actors, and I think in that particular notice or heading, I think it was in one of those film review books. I think what they were really getting at in those days, I worked a lot with uh, actors who were struggling, stars, so-called star actors, who were struggling hard yes, to become yes. stars. Right. And I, and none, maybe not even done any theatre. And so I'd come out of rap and two and a half, three years at Litchfield and other theatres. And I suppose, uh, I, maybe something that sounds, I don't want this to sound cocky, and I'm, believe me, I don't. I think I was pushing too hard, and sometimes directors would say to me, not in front of the other actor, God sake, lift the scene, Lionel, do something, the thing's on the floor. So I often used to get terrible notices for doing everything from A to B, uh, and I overacted on still sessions. <laughs> I, I, and I was pushing, and you see, I had a lot against me. I was very thin, I'd come out of the war, so I was down to about eight stone. I was bald, I'd stuck this dead moth on my face to look, try and look a bit older. And I, I really hadn't got anything, to, I had no category. Yeah. See, I wasn't a leading man, obviously. I wasn't in the character man, Walter Brennan type actor. So I had to rely on just everything to, to feed the family. <laughs> yeah, right. What about your boldness? You went bald quite young, didn't you? Yeah, I worried a lot as a child. Did you? <laughs> uh, yes, I went bald in the war. Uh, I think it was wearing... Uh, 
I was in Burma for a while, and I think they say that uh, oversweating did it. I always had to shave my head. Uh, I was with the West African Frontier Force, and the European officers and sergeants had to make black up. We actually did black up and made our hair tighter so that we weren't picked off. Yeah. So, yes, I went bald in the war. Did it ever worry you, losing your hair? Um, yes, because it happened very quickly. I think if it had happened over a slow period, it wouldn't worry. I just remember particularly one morning at some army camp uh, combing my hair one morning, and it was just coming out in handfuls. And that, for, I called a, a near friend and said, what's going on? Is it happening to you? But a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of soldiers went bald in the Far East. But what about, I mean, what about your, your, your career after that? I mean, did you never feel like wearing a toupee? Because, I mean, a lot of people, I've sat opposite some of the best toupees in the world, yeah. I, want you to yes. know. I really have. Yes, yours is very good. Not, not bad, is it? Dougie <laughs> 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 Haywood. Dougie Haywood toupee, yeah. <laughs> No, but I have. Did you? Well, you never tempted me there. Cause I, I only wore. I wore it in rap because I had to pepper and salt it a lot and play juveniles. And then I think the only film I've ever worn of hair was um, a thing called The Secret of My Success mm. because I had to play a younger I think it was president of South America or something. Mm. But no, I've never worn one. Mm. I've never worn one. Going back to, to what I said earlier about uh, scene stealing, um, this was in fact uh, picked up by some of the press, and it was alleged because of this that there was a rivalry between you and Peter Sellers because you did a lot of films together. Was that true? No, it wasn't true. There was a. Uh, I, I, it, it, we, he and I were, I, I can honestly say, I think really best friends for years. Uh, but then the wrong arm of the law came out, and Peter openly admitted whilst making the picture, he said, I've, I've got the wrong part. I should have played Lionel's part. I should have played the inspector. But I mean, we were halfway into the picture and we both knew that, I'd say. Uh, got a good line today, Pete. He'd say, you rotten sod, you know. But so when the film was over, I got some very, very good banner headline uh, notices. And, uh, but the first person, this is what defies the, the, the whole rumor, was the first person to ring me at seven that next morning was Pete, and he said, Lionel, go out and buy 5,000 copies of the Daily Mail and the Express kit. You, 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 that's it, you've done it, boy. Mm. So, did, you, did, did you share many of his passions? Because um, he had this passion, I know he told me on the show whenever he was on, he had this marvelous passion for collecting old actor stories. Yeah. He told me a classic one about um, an actor called Warrington Minge, I remember. Pressing the check. Pressing the check, yes. <laughs> did, did you? He told me that. He told you that yes, one. Then he told it to you. Yes, yes. that's right. Did, did you have the same passion for the... Yes, the old, yes. He, he, he did come. You see, most actor stories are sad, aren't they? Mm. They've been, there's one very quick one of a very old actor who uh, hadn't worked for 25 years. This is supposed to be true. But it's always good to start a story like that. And uh, he, it was the Edinburgh Festival. And the phone went, and the man said, um, Mr. George Jackson, would you be available to do something at the Edinburgh Festival? He said, my dear, if you think about it, I've thought about it, yes. <laughs> he said, um, would you like to be in a play? He said, I, very much, I haven't done a play for 25 years. <laughs> I'd very much, he said, I'd give it up, but it's my living over a while. <laughs> and he said, uh, would you like uh, to get up here to Edinburgh? And he said, when? He said, now. He said, what would be the fee? I have to ask what the fee would be. He said, well, it would be about five pounds. He said, I'll do it. Very generous. Oh, lovely to be wanted. And he got on the train. He went up to Edinburgh. And the, the producer had given him this line. He'd only one line, which was, hark, I hear the cannons roar. And he rehearsed in the train, Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. <laughs> By the time he got to Edinburgh, he knew it. He <laughs> got in a taxi, went straight to the theatre, and there was no dress rehearsal. They said, well, I didn't want to worry you, but there's no dress rehearsal. You're on in ten minutes. He said, really, Hark, I hear the cannons roar. <laughs> Put on a bit of slap, and the producer said, no, look, it really is. And they go, five minutes, please. He said, what'll happen is you go straight up on the stage. He said, We've got about a thousand people out there. The curtains were open. Take a small beat of about three and then say, Hark, I hear the cannon's voice. He said, got it, my dear. He said, will you come on the stage, please? He went up, said, got in the wings. And he waited. Hush, the lights go down. He walks onto the stage. The curtains are still closed and there's a lovely battlement scene. The mist. Can I stand up? Please do. Got on the stage. And he waited. And the curtains slowly parted. And there was a tremendous offstage cannon drop. And the old boy went, What the bloody hell is that?
That was the canon's role. Yes. <laughs> you also share, I happen to know, with me and, and with, with Peter, you, you shared a, a love too of the music hall, didn't you, and the yes. and comedians? Yes. Were you ever tempted yourself to go on the, on the boards as a comedian? Yes. Um, yes, I, I, I messed about. I did in the army for a bit, you know, and do, did impressions. But uh, this, this thing about music hall and, and, and stand-up comics, I have so much admiration for a man writes his own script, is his own props, his own set, and it's that walk from the wings to that microphone and hold an audience, say for 20 minutes, 10 minutes, or like Victor Borg, for an hour. Mm. The, the bottle you've got to have to do that, the mm. courage. Mm. Uh, so I'm full of admiration. I, if I came home from leave in the war, I mean, I just didn't make for the theater, straight theater. I'd, I'd go to the Crazy Gang. I'd go to Victoria Palace. You worked, of course, at the Crazy yeah, Gang, well, didn't you? Don't. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> was it killers. awful? Work? Killers. Were they? They're terrible. Really? They were terrible. I loved them very much. Well, I did a thing. I was the genie of the lamp, uh, and uh, <laughs> in a in a remake of Alice Button, the float, directed by a great mate of mine, Val Guest, and it was called Clowns in Clover, and I just wore diaphanous Mohammedan trousers, turned up toes, a, 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 a diamond stuck in my belly button, brown all over and a top knot, long fingernails, and I walked on the set to be introduced to the Crazy Gang the first day of shooting, and they had, later in the day, two large guard dogs that were to be in, in the shot, and unbeknownst to me, they had undone the leash and set these dogs at me, and they chased me around stage A at Shepparton with me screaming for mercy. Nobody called them off. My trousers were ripped off me. I lost my top knot. The stone fell out my belly button. <laughs> I was a gibbering wreck. They thought that, that was their sense of humor. What about, I mean, you, you had a very unlikely beginning for a, for a film star, for a film actor, indeed, because your, your mother and father were both, in fact, Salvation Army yes, workers, they were. weren't they? Yes, they were. How did, did therefore, did you get your, your love of, of, of movies and the stage? Well, I've never been able to un understand it, and I, my mother has never been able to understand it, but my father on Salvation Army pay looking after the very poor in Deptford, and uh, uh, they were uh, social workers for the Salvation Army, and we were living in the slums. He somehow or another saved enough money to buy a little pathoscope 9.5 camera and a little pathoscope projector, and his great love was movies. You see, we weren't allowed to go to the pictures mm. in the Salvation Army. They are now, but in those days, we weren't allowed. Oh, sorry, and and, and, and he, at the age of five, I'd be editing on, on the tea table um, and learning uh, left to rights and positions. And I even would do uh, over shoulders for him when we went out filming. He had this enormous, so I was weaned on it, really. Yes. Weaned on movies. What about, what about when you went to the capital of movie making, mm. Hollywood? Mm. What was, was that uh, the, the, your great ambition or, or what? Yes, it, yes, it was. Um, it was Mecca to me. But uh, it filled me with horror. Uh, Los Angeles itself, I felt, was more like a sort of hot shepherd's bush, <laughs> with all due respects to shepherd's bush. <laughs> uh, Beverly Hills, as you well know, is, is a cocoon. It, it's, it's a, its own goldfish bowl. They are, I don't believe they are reasonable within that goldfish bowl. When you're in it, you don't realize how mad everybody is and how aggressive they are. Uh, and you slowly get used to it. It's when you step out of it or see it for the first time. And I, no, I can't stand that. And I found everything seemed to be bigger there. The studios seemed to be bigger. Yes. That aggression that you mentioned, was any of it directed at you at all? Certainly about being bald. Really? Yes. Uh, we, uh, I was just talking to Lillian uh, and to Arthur about it, about being bald. You see, in England you're used to, you see bald-headed fellows all over the place. In Beverly Hills, you don't. It's a sign of weakness in a man to be bald, other than, say, perhaps Telly, Savalas. Uh, and, and, and I mean, somebody makes a fortune in toupees, certainly in Beverly Hills. It is just, it, it's, it's almost an affliction. <laughs> perhaps it is, but they don't like to show it. So when they see me, say, at a dinner party after filming or, or a show party, and there's someone on the periphery of the business I'll get, where'd you get the crazy haircut? Or, um, uh, you, I, I, really, I remember once, shall I tell you that Cannery Road thing? Mm. I 
I remember once we went to dinner after Notorious Landlady, and Dick Quine threw a party for Fred Astaire, uh, Jack Lemmon, Kim Novak, and our stunt doubles. Right. And I was sitting rather like this, the stunt double Dick Crockett at the side of me, and Fred's over here. And I got this in my back. And I turned, and there was a very large man with a sort of goring neck, with the worst toupee you've ever seen. It was like a dead mole. <laughs> and he said, um, are you trying to take the rise out of me, sweetie? <laughs> I said, I'm having my dinner. <laughs> he said, when you came into this joint, you had a toupee on, sweetie. He said, and you've taken it off. He said, because you've recognized that I've got a toupee on. I said, I'd be stupid. Went on having my soup. Well, it got worse, and his wife had told him to tone it down, and she turned it down. He turned it down a little, but it, 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 and the more he drank, the more. And he could not leave me alone. And I was saying things like, I would remind him, sir, that I'm a guest in your country, being <laughs> terribly <laughs> pulling the ox and bucks tie together. Until eventually, my stunt double, who had been a killer, I think he'd been inside for grievous bodily harm, and I, I mean, uh, <laughs> he looked a wee bit like me. He was bald as well, and he said, "Just a minute, my dear." He said, "This friend of mine, Mr. Lionel Jeffries, is a, a guest. Is quite right, is a guest in our country." And he said, uh, "I think if you want to direct any more of the remarks about being bald, you should do it to me, sweetie." And he said, "All right." He said, so. And Dick Crockett said, "Enough's enough," and he picked him up by the front of his shirt. And he did, it all went into slow motion. This man left beautifully over the table, <laughs> taking napkins and chairs and tables and ended up on the sidewalk. The place disintegrated and Fred, a star, who had not moved, had a soup bowl like this and watched it with his spoon and went up. We slid under the table, but Fred watched the plates going over his head. <laughs> But they, I mean, there hasn't got a tag to the story. The thing is that there, I, yes, I used to go through quite miserable times about being bald. And briefly now, we've seen you back um, on our screens, television screens, in mm -hmm. fact, recently, where I thought you were absolutely marvellous in, uh, in Potter's play, um, uh, Cream in My, my Coffee. Thing. Does that mean, in fact, that you're gonna, you've got the acting bug again? Because, in fact, you've been away from acting for a while, haven't you? Yes, a long time ago. The last one was with dear old Pete, be just before, well, not just before, it was The Prisoner's End. And I hadn't done any uh, acting, um, because I've been directing or writing since then. And then this marvelous script arrived, and then the chance to work with Peggy Ashcroft, the mm -hmm. chance to work with Gavin Miller, Ken Trodd, it was, it was almost like a mafia, uh, a, an offer I couldn't refuse. Mm. It was beautiful, I loved it. So we're gonna see more of you. Well, Very much you hope can. you do, because oh, you're marvelous you. in that, and uh, you've thank been sorely missed. Thank you, Marshall. Jeffries, thank you Bless very much your heart. indeed. Thank you. Thank you.